I was talking about the general outline of the lecture, which is supposed to give you some historical overview, to sketch the history of memory, and to sketch also the, um, let's say, uh, the uh, origins of the museum, its uh, agenda as such, and to the criticism or reactions, let's say, that it faced. Um, so, um, just to start, I would like to um, mention some, some of the surprises that, uh, uh, that you can encounter when trying to investigate contested histories of, uh, let's say, um, Polish 20th century as such. So basically the idea is that we have this apparently important historical event of the World War II, which is the Warsaw Uprising. So how come that the uprising didn't have, uh, which happened in 1944, didn't have its museum until 2004? But also we can uh, think about it. How come that this uh, event was seen as highly controversial and even neglected for years, but then became a key element of the Polish memory culture? Uh, plus, uh, we can puzzle uh, about the, the situation in which one Warsaw Museum incited two memory booms in Poland, in Polish memory culture. And finally, which is going to be like the final point uh, of my talk, uh, how come that uh, when this long-awaited museum finally was open, it was received not only with enthusiasm, but also with fierce criticism? There can be many more such questions, and some will be connected to the very military and political history of the World War II. So let's, let's start with some uh, historical overview of the uprising as such. Um, so basically, the Warsaw Uprising uh, was the anti-Nazi uprising organized by the Polish resistance by the so-called Home Army. Uh, and it can be said that it was the biggest military operation organized by any resistance movement in Europe during the World War II, and probably the biggest military operation organized in the city space, in the city. Um, and of course, its, its general aim was to liberate the capital from the, from, from the occupation, which lasted for already five years when the uprising started. Uh, so let's uh, have a look at something like the military and political situation of Warsaw uh, in 1944. It's the fifth year of German occupation, but the Germans are already facing failures on the Eastern Front and the Red Army is approaching. So it is seen as a good moment for the Polish underground to organize um, uh, an uprising to liberate the city. And, uh, but this basically anti-Nazi uh, movement has also a hidden or not so much hidden anti-Soviet agenda. Uh, that point of the leaders of the underground is to try to liberate Warsaw on their own not to owe the liberation to Stalin and to the Red Army. So they, their idea is to start the fight when the Red Army approaches to get probably some help from them, but to keep the independent position, to reinforce also Polish position in the negotiations about the future shape of Europe and its independence from the Soviet. So as you uh, already know, uh, knowing the general outline of the European history, they were to be heavily disappointed. So the uprising started on the 1st of August, 1944. It was intended to last a few days and it was basically a very brutal and uh, heavy street battle. Uh, it was led mainly by underarmed soldiers uh, who were receiving little or no help from the Western Alliance or from the Red Army that uh, did not uh, decide to intervene. Um, but uh, what can be surprising is that uh, the battle lasted very long, for more than two months. 
It was based on the um, sacrifice of the soldiers who are mainly young people, uh, including even children and not mentioning women. Germans who were expected to be weakened and to retreat from Warsaw answered with systemic destruction of the city and its citizens. So the result of the uprising had to be the surrender of home army with a tragic death toll of over 200,000 people um, and the vast majority of the victims were civilians. So of course, it immediately incited debates. Did it at all make sense to start the uprising? Was it worth it? Should the decision of the home army of the underground leaders have been different? And of course, there were two basic attitudes, two basic answers. One, that uh, the tragic result of the uprising is a definite answer to the question and that nothing is worth such destruction under no circumstances. And the other, that the uprising, of course, is a tragedy, but this is a noble tragedy, a definite proof of Polish spirit and freedom, a lesson of patriotism, and that this suffering lays a basis, a fundament of, for future Polish freedom and future Polish national identity. So you can see that immediately we enter here the realm of history of memory that builds over the events and becomes a part of memory itself, which is, by the way, brilliantly analyzed by my co-speaker, Marcin Matiłkowski, in his book uh, on the Warsaw Uprising, very much recommended. Um, okay, so now let's think for a while about uh, the history of memory, how the uprising could be remembered. After what was already said, it will come, I guess, with no surprise that this anti-Nazi fact was not a convenient topic for the official propaganda of newly established socialist Poland after the World War II, uh, a country which was subordinated to the Soviet Union. Uh, so we ha have the situation in which, uh, in which, on the one hand, um, there was this massive death and a work of mourning after this massive death is somehow indispensable. But at the same time, this mourning could not be acknowledged by the state. And for a couple of years, it resulted in a memory ban which was put on the uprising, that it was banned from official commemoration. But of course, at the same time, it was unofficially remembered and commemorated in a way, in a partisan way. Um, and uh, state used to persecute those commemorating uh, the uprising uh, and especially uh, those who were members of the home army, etc. Uh, as you can imagine, as a result, we have um, a memory which is heavily politicized. Uh, so the opinion on the uprising served as a kind of a litmus test um, of the attitude towards the regime. So on the one hand, we have this community of those who remember the uprising and oppose uh, the regime. And on the other hand, those who are seen as enemies. Uh, so commemoration uh, of the uprising became a code of resistance and was used in the context of anti-communist opposition movement uh, in the Polish People's Republic. Uh, this way of thinking can be uh, very well illustrated by the contemporary mural, which is located by the Warsaw Uprising Museum nowadays, uh, in which you can see that uh, the photograph of the soldiers of the uprising, the insurgents from the August 1944, um, their figures are juxtaposed with the photo uh, of the solidarity leaders from August 1980. Um, so from this point of view, one of my opening questions could seem easy. The uprising was anti-communist. It was a code of resistance during the uh, communist times. So the museum, of course, could not have been organized until the fall of the regime in 1989. But things are much more complicated. First, uh, the ban was, as you can see here, temporary. And it simply couldn't work properly. 
and after it was cancelled, a state official politics of memory had to put some effort to inscribe somehow the uprising in this official vision of the history of Poland as a part of Polish military history. So the general idea was to pay the tribute to the ordinary soldiers and the heroism, and at the same time condemn the leaders for their unreasonable decisions. And of course, it could be consistent with traumatic memory of the uprising in which it is seen as a tragedy, tragedy, but also as a proof of this exceptional patriotic merit. So during the communist times, many concessions had, uh, had to be made by the state to the living memory of the uprising. Man, many commemorations had to be established. And for instance, visible here, uh, there is this statue of the little soldier of the uprising, which was erected in the 80s, in uh, 1983, and now is one of the landmarks of the historical old town in Warsaw, however controversial from the contemporary point of view of children's rights it may be. And secondly, it is also due during the communist times when the general shape of myth of the uprising solidifies, not, not only it's banned from uh, uh, this official memory for some years, but also uh, is being stronger and stronger. Uh, of course, we still have the traumatic narrative about the tragedy of the city, its inhabitants, its soldiers. But at the same time, uh, we have the uprising as a symbol of freedom and rebellion. And at the same time, its memory is embedded in the military nationalist masculine narratives. And th that is the moment uh, or the place where the official memory uh, of, uh, of the state and the resistant memory uh, could meet somehow. Uh, insurgents uh, are seen, are perceived as role models. Uh, this appeals especially to those who are, uh, who are young, who are peers of the insurgents from 1944, who are very young people, as I indicated. So uprising becomes an issue connected to youth, to beauty, to adventure, to bravery and heroism at the same time. Uh, so a myth is created and solidified, uh, in which the uprising is an ultimately Polish experience. And what does it mean uh, uh, to be Polish in this context? It, it means being heroic, being betrayed, of course. It means suffering and reviving. We have here this narrative which is inspired by religion and uh, the uprising as a realization of a kind of a Christ, uh, Christian ideal, a, a Catholic faith, is seen as something which was source of the insurgent's strength, their endurance. Uh, and of course, this kind of memory produces both commemoration, this living memory as well, and exclusion, because it can deepen these divisions between us and them, I already mentioned, uh, in such a way that the good memory of the uprising comes as a kind of patriotic duty. And here we come to the 1989 uh, and to the question why the museum could not have been opened just after the fall of the regime. Of course, there were many organizational difficulties connected to things like the search uh, for the appropriate location and so on. But generally, it is interpreted in terms of politics of memory. The 90s in Poland are seen as a period of transition, of modernization and soft conservatism, when the officials didn't want to touch controversial historical issues and wanted to focus on the future, on projects like joining the EU, etc. So, a museum about the uprising was always being planned, was always seen as something that should be done, but never came to life until the 21st century. Uh, that's when the new project of the politics of memory um, is introduced by the right-wing conservative party Law and Justice. The project is aimed uh, at revolutionizing attitudes towards the past in Polish politics. 
And its general assumption is that national identity should be based on common collective memory and that it's an important task for the state to produce the condition to strengthen this memory and this identity. Uh, and as you can see uh, in this quote from Lech Kaczyński, um, one of the uh, proponents of, uh, of the new politics, new party, uh, the Warsaw Uprising is seen as a crucial element of this memory politics. So, uh, Lech Kaczyński was then mayor of Warsaw and um, he was very engaged in the project of opening the museum. What happened on the 60th anniversary, uh, the 1st of August 2004? Um, and the, the museum was open from the initiative of the mayor and under the, his auspices, let's say. So he can be easily called the creator of the museum. And this success helped him to gain popularity and become the president of Poland just, um, just a year later. But from our point of view, uh, what is uh, crucial here is maybe not so much about uh, Polish politics and uh, the, the figure of Lech Kaczyński in it, but uh, the moment when a new chapter of the history uh, of memory of the uprising and of Polish memory culture opens uh, in 2004. Uh, as you can see here, the, this moment was seen as um, uh, as a turning point for collective memory, for something like historical conscience, when the Warsaw Uprising became a hot topic, surprisingly, in a way. And also, it was a new phase of Polish museum culture, when a new type of a museum was introduced. Uh, it's also the moment when we can talk about the uprising in the context of capitalism and commodification. This process becomes very well visible, which establishes as well new language and new media of memory. So, what kind of museum it is? How did it find its own path within the complicated field of Polish uprising memory? When it comes to the museum rhetoric, let's say media design, uh, the way it influences the visitors, etc., I won't elaborate on that because it will be much better visible during the tour. Uh, what is essential uh, from my point of view now is that the museum creates an appealing and inviting space uh, and encourages visitors to explore it, to engage in it. Uh, when it comes to, let's say, the museum agenda in terms of um, its official mission statement, uh, it is underlined that uh, the museum should be seen as a tribute. But uh, I would focus on its more prospective role on the first place. Uh, I would like to share with you some interpretation of the memory training the museum prepares for the visitors, the image of the uprising it creates. So it must be said that the soldiers of the home army are the protagonists and subjects of the museum's narrative, uh, which opens with phone boxes when the soldiers' testimonies can be heard. Uh, civilians ap appear within its framework as one of, of uh, objects of the story, a collective background character rather than the subject of, of individual story of suffering. The museum is full of uh, the insurgent spaces, young and beautiful. Uh, the combat is shown, I would say, basically in two aspects. One is as an attract attractive adventure. Anyone would like to take part in, as just like anyone would like to uh, engage in this uh, immersive, uh, inspiring, highly interesting museum space. On the other hand, uh, it is also seen as a heroic yet indispensable duty, which was maintained by bravery and the virtue of this uh, real poles uh, rooted in religious faith. Uh, it was an effort that mystically saved Poland, its identity, its dignity and honor. Uh, and particular emphasis is put on the anti-communism of the uprising and on the lack of support from the side of the Red Army. 
It is enough to say that Stalin's name appears in the exhibition and in the guidebook much more often than, than Adolf Hitler's. So um, we can say that the Warsaw Uprising Museum supports a vision of the past in which the national identity, patriotism, tradition, religion, military heroism, sacrifice are the most important values and in which the Polish national perspective is the default one. But at the same time, it makes this vision of history modern, appealing, interesting. Um, it must be also mentioned that uh, the museum um, has a wide range of other activities that influence the memory field. Of course, it's a normal nowadays for a museum to serve also as an educational and social center, but they, the, the museum as an institution goes far beyond it. It supports a number of other projects concerned with the uprising. Uh, from the financial and organizational point of view. Uh, this means also propagating the uprising as a topic of popular culture. So uh, um, consequently, the museum becomes a kind of a patron of the memory discourse about the uprising. But uh, its dominant position in this discourse is uh, obvious. So uh, being uh, a patron of many different projects, also some that uh, realize different agendas, it stays uh, on the position of, uh, of a leader. And uh, to uh, somehow sum up with showing the impact of the museum, which is clearly visible in uh, Polish contemporary culture, I would just mention two important trends in uh, Polish culture of the 21st century it inspired. The first is the Polish museum boom. I won't elaborate on that, but as you can see, since 2004, multiple new institutions of this type have been founded. So the Warsaw Uprising Museum set a precedent for its followers. followers. Uh, its success reframed thinking about museum culture in Poland. And the second thing uh, can be called the um, Uprising boom or the 44 boom. Uh, because the uprising became a highly attractive and recognizable cultural topic. It appears in new contexts, and uh, as it used to be an important issue for those dealing with history and politics, it is now an object of massive engagement, being perceived as the most important event of the World War II in Poland. As you can see on this photo showing one of the anniversaries of Warsaw Uprising. So from this point of view, we can easily say that the Warsaw Uprising Museum um, made a huge success in terms of collective memory and politics of memory, of course. Uh, so now let's finish with the reactions towards the museum. Uh, it was undoubtedly received with enthusiasm in many groups. I mean, insurgent community, also community, political elites, public historians, uh, some teachers, uh, also ordinary visitors, let's say, who reported having a new and spectacular museum experience. But at the same time, uh, it was um, often criticized uh, from various point of, points of view, and I tried to um, uh, to uh, prepare for you this uh, very short excerpts of uh, from uh, many uh, articles and um, and talks just to uh, give the general overview of the uh, of the reactions. So we can uh, distinguish here uh, several main arguments or lines of criticism uh, uh, that, that the museum faces. The first uh, is about the museum design. Uh, the museum is seen as offering too much entertainment and too little reflection about the past. And its exhibition is sometimes seen as inappropriate to discuss atrocities and traumas. Um, the second argument is connected to the influence on the visitors. Uh, the museum offers too much indulging in the past. It, in a way, it encourages, paradoxically, the visitors to enjoy the suffering, as the suffering is so noble and so beautiful. 
um, and to, to value sacrifice over life. This is uh, connected to uh, next arguments that uh, are about exclusions. So this is a narrative that ignores or at least diminishes experiences of the past that don't fit in the general model. That is especially civilian perspective, women perspective, other minority perspectives. And it leads to producing an exceptionally self-centered narrative um, of this remembering community of Poles, uh, imaginary insurgents or supporters of the uprising. Um, so it ca can uh, produce incapability to take into account the wider picture, uh, to um, make people ignore the suffering or, uh, of others, to hinder empathy and thinking in terms of alternative histories. So basically, this memory training I was trying to sketch for you here, um, we can say that uh, the museum produces uh, questionable attitudes and self-perception with the use of mechanism which is similar to flattery. Um, all these arguments, however, uh, present in the liberal or progressive press and in scholarly discourse are vulnerable to, to, to this kind of the patriotic blackmail I was talking about in the beginning. So um, the argument is as follows. You somehow have to pay your tribute to the uprising if you want to be a real Pole in a proper way, to uh, belong to this uh, remembering community. And uh, its uh, 21st century extension would say you should appreciate the Warsaw Uprising memory for the same sake. So uh, I was trying to give you uh, some uh, overview of the Warsaw Uprising Museum success and possible criticism or drawbacks uh, it has as well. Um, I will be very happy to uh, try to answer any questions you might have. And if uh, something pops up uh, after the meeting, uh, you can always contact me uh, by, um, by, by email and I will be very happy to discuss uh, contested histories uh, with you. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you very much, Maria. That was a, a very like nice overview of uh, and definitely gave us a, a lot of background and, and food for thought. Um, um, Carol, I see that you also, uh, you have your, your uh, video on and you had a question. So could I ask you to unmute yourself and ask the question yourself? And then, um, if you are first unmuted. Then. Unmute. Yes. Yeah. Hello, um, I'm Carol Mann from Paris, and my question is about how is the um, memory of the Warsaw Ghetto weaved into the official narrative? Is it mentioned at all in the museum? Is it seen as something an embarrassment or something just that one discards? Uh, how is it presented? And if it's not presented, well, we, it, it becomes a big political discourse then about which fits in again with the present um, denial uh, politics of the government. Anyway, my question, well, that's my question, uh, which I put in the chat. Thank you very much. Uh, can I answer now or should we just gather questions? How do you plan it? No, it's, it, it's good to, uh, to answer it now. Thank you very much, Carol, for this question, because it uh, allows us uh, to bring uh, to the fore this very important aspect I didn't have enough time to discuss during my talk. Um, basically, uh, if you ask if the Warsaw Ghetto and especially the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, which could, could be also called a Warsaw Uprising one year be uh, uh, before, if, uh, if you ask if this is present in the exhibition, yes, it is. Um, but uh, it, uh, it's, uh, it comes with some problems, I would say. Uh, the one thing is that you, can, um, you have uh, information about the uh, Holocaust and the terror aimed at uh, Polish Jewish uh, population presented within the exhibition as something which is generally the part of um, 
uh, on the suffering of Polish people. So, so that's basically how it is. So uh, it is supposed to make you somehow um, uh, feel uh, that brutality of the occupation in Poland rather than think about the exceptionality of, uh, of the fate of Jewish communities. So that's one thing. Um, uh, another thing is that uh, actually there is uh, this um, part of the exhibition which is devoted to the ghetto. And uh, I have heard from the museum staff and from the museum guides that it was put in here uh, to somehow um, uh, thinking about the international visitors who just cannot distinguish the ghetto uprising that they are already familiar with with the uprising of 1944, they are not familiar with. So it's uh, like the for the sake of the general argument. Plus, what is, from my point of view, what, what is the most problematic is that you also have some testimonies of, um, uh, of Polish Jewish uh, people and uh, ghetto soldiers like Marek Edelman that are somehow included in the exhibition and uh, some um, contested issues are mentioned in the testimonies, like uh, the hostility between the Poles and the Jews and so on. But it is included in, in the exhibition in such a way that it is very, very hard to really notice it. So it works more like a the alibi, I would say. So uh, this would be my short answer about this topic in the very exhibition of the museum. But we can also say that uh, as an institution, the museum uh, supports sometimes, for instance, um, memory projects that uh, focus on uh, the history of the ghetto, of Jewish also, and so on. So uh, it may be seen as a complicated issue. Thank you very much, Maria. Okay. Thank you for answering that question. Um, I see that Edith Gill has a question about the language in the museum. Okay, thank you very much for a very interesting lecture. Uh, I know several years ago when I was in Warsaw and I wanted to visit this museum, I was told that most of it is basically in Polish and there is very little English translation. And it doesn't work for me to go there. I wonder if it's still like this and can you say something about the language or is it basically the museum is for Poles and not for foreigners or for tourists? Mm -hmm. Um, actually, uh, I don't have like very up to date uh, data about that, so maybe Martin would be able to add something. But basically, I I have this general impression that uh, this museum is uh, uh, perceived as something that should have both internal and external role. But in the context of international visitors, I think. Um, the aim is to uh, present them something like a general overview of the event of the Warsaw Uprising as such. Something like that happened and was very tragic and uh, there is all this narrative about heroism and merit and youth and beauty which is connected to it. And so I'm not sure whether uh, what parts of exhibition stay untranslated, but for sure this, let's say, main exhibition boards uh, are bilingual in Polish and in English. Uh, and they organize also tours in English if uh, someone wants a guide. Uh, and as far as I know, uh, the Warsaw Uprising Museum is seen as one of the highlights of Warsaw also for the international tourists uh, who can visit it to somehow have a unique museum experience and uh, to be able to engage in Polish history. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Um, I also have a, a question myself. Um, I was wondering if you, if you, if I would go to the museum and I see all these like protagonists, the, the insurgents, and everybody is. It looks. I get the impression that everybody in Warsaw was sort of engaged in the uprising, and because that's uh, what I get um, from what you presented. How can you then later explain what happened afterwards? That sort of see, well, because after 1944, 1945, for, for decades, Poland has been communist. So how does the museum deal with that fact? 
So basically, they deal with it with a very strong narrative about, let's say, the second occupation. So uh, the, that, uh, the period of the Polish People's Republic is, uh, uh, is shown uh, as somehow parallel to the period of the German occupation. And actually, uh, the narrative of the exhibition ends uh, somewhere in the 80s, or uh, I guess uh, one of the last things we see uh, at, uh, at the exhibition is uh, the photo of the Polish Pope, uh, John Paul II, uh, visiting Warsaw in, um, I don't know, 83 or something like that. Please correct me if I'm wrong. So, um, so the idea is to show uh, uh, the hi history of the 20th century uh, in Poland as, uh, uh, as, as follows. That we had something like a this short period of independ independence before the World War II, which was uh, such a great success of this uh, Polish military sacrifice and fight for independence. And then we had something like 70 years of occupation, basically. And it ended somewhere near 1989, which is another complicated topic because uh, in this narrative, you don't put basically something like a final point of, uh, of the Polish People's Republic precisely somewhere in 1989, but uh, don't mess with it for now. But uh, uh, that's how it is. So, you know, this uh, real Polish people were under occupation all the time and communists are somehow uh, traitors or uh, internal enemies. That's how it can be, uh, can be said uh, briefly. Thank you very much. Um, I see that there are still two people like with their hands up. So I would like to give them both um, the, the floor. Uh, first, Joanna Boydon and then Anna Lolua. Uh, and after that, we'll have a, a short break before we go back to the, the virtual tour by Martin. So, uh, Joanna. So, very briefly, thank you for a great presentation. Uh, and I pasted uh, links to two forthcoming uh, publications by Routledge in a series of global perspectives on public history with chapters in both. There are chapters by Paweł uh, Ukierski, deputy director of the Warsaw Rising Museum. Uh, on some aspects of the development of uh, exhibition in uh, in this uh, book on public and public history and on uh, museum boom in Poland um, on in this uh, public history in Poland but what is interesting I think in this public history in Poland there is also another chapter on the same uh, museum boom by Anna Zimbinska Witek uh, which is a totally different story so for those of you who are interested in those disputes on the museum's memory exhibitions in Poland you can see uh, you will be able to read two totally different interpretations in one book I deliberately left them as they were uh, to see that there is no agreement at all these are like stories about two different phenomena, but they are about the same things, uh, just different interpretations. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing this. Yeah, I agree. It's good, the collective knowledge. Um, so, Anna. Um, yes, um, thank you for giving me a word and thank you, Maria, so much for your presentation. Really interesting topic. Um, I would want to know more about um, how on official level, but also in public in, in, um, in Polish society, um, what's the relation between um, memory on Warsaw Uprising as important event as you presented it today and um, Solidarność movement um, is another important movement. How these memories relate to each other? Do they compete uh, to be most important memory? Do they somehow reinforce each other? What relation does it, does it really um, uh, does the um, social background or political um, um, interest of a person matter uh, which event he considers the impo most important? Uh, what is the place of these events in Polish memory culture um, in relations with one another? Thank you. 
Thank you very much uh, for these questions because it once again introduces us into a whole realm of uh, interesting subjects to uh, discuss. So basically, uh, I would say that these are two threads of uh, Polish remembering, uh, communal remembering, collective and so on, but also official, that basically do not compete. Because uh, that's for many reasons. And one of these reasons uh, is what I briefly mentioned in my presentation and what Martin elaborates on in his book, that um, this uh, uh, memory of the Warsaw Uprising and generally the memory of uh, resistance during the World War II uh, was used as something like a code, a general pattern to talk about uh, engagement of the anti-communist op opposition during the PPR times. Uh, so, uh, and this, uh, this mural I showed you can uh, be like a very short uh, uh, presentation of, uh, of this general tendency, um, but you can find many, many more. Um, so, uh, it is uh, from the point of view from, of this, let's say, mainstream narrative about the Warsaw Uprising, you can say that um, basically, uh, the uprising won, but won after the anti-communist opposition in Poland won, not earlier. So it is like a very delayed victory, 60 years, I mean, not 60, 50 years after, after the event. Um, so uh, from this point of view, these are the memories that somehow cooperate or reinforce each other. And... Uh, I am of the opinion that uh, basically the memory of the Warsaw Uprising is uh, now uh, stronger, uh, dominant as uh, Lie de Memoir in uh, Polish memory culture. And that's also because um, uh, the memory of the solidarity movement uh, is, um, uh, is divided because of, uh, let's say it briefly, the political divisions of the 90s and, uh, and later. So, um, uh, the memory of the uprising uh, proposes something like a very clear and uh, very uh, pre precise frame uh, to uh, think about this imaginary community of uh, remembrance, of uh, Poles remembering about their history and so on. And that is something that to an extent lacks the memory of, uh, uh, of solidarity movement and of the transition. I guess that's something uh, which is very well visible in, uh, in the works of uh, Jan Kubik, for instance, who uh, has written extensively on, on the topic, this lack of the general frame uh, about uh, the memory of, uh, uh, of the transition, which is connected also with, uh, uh, with the opposition movement during the communist times. 